As the data has been showing us for the last couple of weeks, the sacrifice of Vermonters to stay home and stay safe is having a positive impact on the number of COVID-19 cases here in Vermont. And we're continuing to see what appears to be a plateau. Mr. Pichek will share details on our latest modeling in a moment. And I want to thank Vermonters for all they've done to get us to this point. But I also want to remind everyone, now is not the time to declare victory. Because I think we all know it's going to take us all doing more of what we've been doing to get us through this plateau and into a downward trend. Things like staying home, uh, staying separated, wearing a mask, washing our hands are still as important today as it, as it was in the beginning. And while I know it's been difficult and continues to be, have a tremendous impact on our economy, I believe it's getting us through this with the fewest number of cases and loss of life and will also result in a less severe economic impact in the long run. Because of all the measures we put into place and because we've been so dedicated, our data shows we can allow a few more people back to work. And as I've said before, because we have one of the strongest stay home orders in the country with more restrictions than most, we can open up the spigot a bit more to catch up and get more in line with our neighbor states. But with these small steps, um, we have to make sure uh, that we're being responsible. Uh, this comes down to each and every one of us to do so. As my order laid out last week, whether you're a business that's been open or is new newly opened, you must continue to follow our health and safety guidelines, like keeping employees and customers six feet apart, requiring frequent hand washing and disinfecting of surfaces, wearing a cloth fa uh, face mask in public, both employees and customers, requiring employees to stay home if they're sick or have symptoms, and more. Another really important aspect of today's order is establishing training requirements for employers and employees to help everyone working or returning to work understand how they can help themselves and keep others safe. It's these kinds of steps that are going to help us continue to slowly turn the spigot in a way that helps prevent outbreaks and we can keep moving forward. Because in order to win both the battle um, um, on health and, and the economic battle as well, each of us has to be smart and has to be vigilant. Now, before I get into the steps we're taking today, I want to remind everyone of the principles we set that guide any reopenings. First, we'll continue to keep our eyes on the data to make sure we pay attention to what's happening and that we continue to move in the right direction. Second, we'll make sure our health care system remains ready so we're prepared to fight outbreaks as they happen and we have the capacity to treat COVID patients. Third, we'll continue to work with our state lab, hospitals, and commercial labs to make testing more available with a focus on proactive testing and followed up by building upon our strong contact tracing program. Fourth, we'll find ways to work smarter and play and, and work smarter and work safer. Uh, so when we put people back to work, we'll know they're safe and keeping their families safe as well. And finally, we'll plan for ways to play smarter and play safer so Vermonters can do the things that they love best about Vermont in a way that doesn't put health at risk. Again, this will be a very measured, moderate approach guided by data and science, and we'll keep talking with our neighbor states along the way. With all these principles in mind, here's what our next small step forward will look like. Building on last week's order will allow small crews of five or less to perform outdoor work or work in unoccupied structures. We'll also allow manufacturing and distribution operations to open with a maximum of five employees in a space large enough to keep these workers at least six feet apart at all times. For those businesses already open using curbside pickup or delivery, they must continue to operate with a minimum number of employees possible. This latest order will also uh, allow a, uh, an outdoor retail facility, such as a garden center or a greenhouse, 
to allow in-person buying in these outdoor spaces, but no more than 10 people, including customers and staff, will be permitted at any one time. And as I said last week, the Agency of Agriculture has been working on a plan to allow for the reopening of farmers markets on May 1st. But let me be clear, this will not be a traditional farmers market. I've asked that guidance focus on food distribution, not a social gathering. Again, the best way to continue to make uh, small steps, uh, take small steps forward, is to make sure we put health and safety first. All of us, employers, employees, customers, must take this responsibility seriously. This is literally in our hands, and we have to do this right, because we don't want to lose ground or change the trajectory we're on. If we want to continue getting Vermonters back to work, there must be a constant, consistent, everyday battle to fight this virus. Again, I know some will think this is too much, and there are others who will think this is not enough. But I continue to make this pledge to Vermonters. We will take a careful and measured approach with health as the number one priority. No one wants to get Vermont back to work more than me. But as we do, we must outsmart and beat this virus. I know together we can build on our progress, stay united in this work, and get through this stronger than before. And as we think about our economic challenges about, uh, about this recovery, I'm pleased to have Congressman Welch here with us on the phone to give us an update on what's happening in Washington. Congressman Welch, are you on the phone? I am. Great. Thanks for joining uh, us. Governor, thank Well, I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, I. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, the most important focus that you have is the right focus to have is the most important one, and that's the health and safety of Vermonters. And the more Vermonters are paying attention to the steps we have to take to keep ourselves and the people we love healthy and safe, that's going to have a ripple effect uh, beyond Vermont because uh, we all have to be in this together. Uh, and the states, through our governors, uh, have to take the uh, responsibility and the lead on the measures that are required for uh, Vermonters and all of us to be safe. Uh, and uh, that's a big responsibility, and uh, you and your team are uh, really facing this very directly. And uh, as one Vermont citizen, I want to say thank you for that. The federal role um, is really important uh, as well. And that is to try to get us through uh, what is uh, an economic uh, crisis. Uh, the effect of social distancing is to shut down business for quite some time. And we know we have to do it, but it's not without consequence. Uh, so I'm very pleased in Washington that there's been strong bipartisan support uh, for economic measures. Uh, and I'll just go through those very quickly, but that is the $1,200 checks that are going out. Uh, they were a little slow coming, but they seem to be underway. Anybody has problems with that, then contact us and we'll try to check into it. The unemployment insurance supplement uh, is helping. And of course, the payroll protection plan uh, and the economic injury disaster loans. The payroll protection plan fund ran out. And uh, yesterday, uh, we were in the House of Representatives and passed additional funds uh, for that program. It's been very popular in Vermont. Uh, we've had about 7,000 businesses uh, successfully uh, get authorized and have funds available uh, of about a billion dollars. And that uh, is, I think you've pointed out, puts Vermont as the third highest per capita in the utilization of that program. Yet many Vermont businesses were not, uh, didn't quite make it before funds ran dry. And the legislation that, that uh, was passed in the Senate a few days ago uh, with the strong support of Senator Sanders and Senator Leahy, uh, we voted on yesterday uh, in the House. And what it does is, number one, <clears throat> adds $370 billion to the payroll protection plan and the economic injury disaster loans. So Vermont businesses that uh, uh, have filed applications, there's now money that's available through the SBA uh, to hopefully have your application be successfully 
uh, granted. Uh, the legislation also puts $60 billion uh, in the uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan and Grant Program. Uh, so I would encourage Vermont businesses to make those applications. The legislation specifically authorizes these programs to be available to Vermont's agricultural com uh, uh, community. And uh, we know that uh, Vermont dairy is really on the ropes, and we're hopeful that this, this uh, additional language, making it very specific that these programs do apply to our dairy farms, that this can be helpful. In addition, there is $100 billion uh, in this package that goes back to uh, for health care. It's $75 billion to help our hospitals, and that's obviously extremely critical for us in Vermont. Uh, we've got a network of hospitals serving rural Vermont, uh, as well as, of course, uh, our UVM Medical Center. Uh, and this is going to be very important that Vermont get uh, some help in order to maintain the important work that those hospitals are providing to us now and in the future. And then one additional provision that I think is extremely important and overdue is $25 billion for testing. Uh, and Governor, as you said, it, this first step in this is that we have to have social distancing to flatten the curve, and we're having some success uh, on that effort. But then that doesn't cure the disease. It doesn't eradicate the disease. We have to then do testing. We have to do contact tracing. And then we have to have a capacity to quarantine. And this $25 billion in testing is an acknowledgement uh, of the absolute fundamental importance of testing going forward. So Congress has authorized the funding. We want to get that back, back uh, to the states uh, to help uh, the states where the, where the big challenges of implementation is going to occur. So this is good news, but I want to also acknowledge that this is incredibly difficult and challenging times for uh, Vermont enterprises. You know, most of our Vermont businesses are, they're small, they're small family affairs. The people who work there are like family. And to suddenly um, have to, for public health reasons, shut down uh, adds financial anxiety uh, as well as health anxiety. And as much as these programs have been funded, you know, the first package was $2.2 trillion, the second this one was close to uh, $480 billion. Uh, it's probably not enough, and uh, we're going to have to continue our efforts. My hope is that on this, too, we'll be working with the SBA to uh, get input from our businesses about where we can make uh, some adjustments in what the regulations are to provide some flexibility to meet the needs of the particular circumstances of our businesses. That's important that we continue to be as responsive as we can be to the real world situation that uh, our businesses face. Uh, the, I just wanna say something about going forward. Uh, as you pointed out, Governor, uh, this uh, economic uh, situation has placed immense pressure on state revenues. Vermont's not unique at all. And we must, have, have as a focus going for uh, in Congress going forward, providing aid to the states, and I think that is an acknowledgement that the revenues have collapsed in states. And if the federal government is really the only governmental entity that has the fiscal capacity to respond to this uh, once in a hundred year event, if we don't, uh, in somewhat generously then it's gonna put enormous pressure on our property taxpayers who are, uh, it's gonna put enormous pressure on our state budget where will we be able to uh, fund education the way our kids need it? Will we be able to provide access to healthcare uh, the way our citizens need it? And this event was not the uh, result of any actions in any state, it's the result of the public health uh, epidemic. So my hope going forward is that uh, in the next aid package, we do focus on two things, one uh, among others, but one is uh, aid to the states and, and B is flexibility so that the states, when they do get aid, can make some of these tough decisions that are better made uh, in Montpelier and, and uh, in your office, Governor, uh, rather than in Washington. So uh, it's great to be a partner uh, with Patrick and Bernie and you and your team. Uh, this is a situation where Vermonters know from experience 
that the best approach is all of us in it together, all for one and one for all. And uh, somehow, some way, with persistence and calmness, we'll get through this. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Peter. We appreciate uh, all you've done for our state as well as the rest of the congressional delegation and trying to work together. And uh, we're doing that on the local level as well with our, our legislative counterparts and uh, just trying to get through this and take the politics out of it. And you've been successful in doing that, uh, and we appreciate that. Thank you, Governor. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Pichek for his presentation on modeling. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Governor. Uh, my name is Mike Pichek. Uh, I serve as the Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Financial Regulation, uh, and I have been leading the state's efforts to model and forecast the trajectory of COVID-19 in our state. Uh, today is our fourth media briefing on the state's efforts to forecast the progression and impact of coronavirus in Vermont. As in previous briefings, I will provide an overview of the developments from the past week and then touch on a look forward. Overall, the news continues to be good. Vermont's actual experience continues to trend better than even our best case forecasts. Last week, we announced we had reached the peak of new confirmed cases. This week, the data indicates that we have likely reached our peak regarding the demand on hospital resources as well. And also, in the near future, we anticipate reaching our peak of Vermonters with the active virus, a very important indicator. I want to start first with an update on our mobility data. Our first slide illustrates the decrease in mobility in Vermont over time. First, for Vermont on the left, and then northern New England on the right. You can clearly see Vermont's high level of compliance and that also compares favorably to our counterparts in northern New England. Further, and I think most importantly, you can also clearly see Vermonters' continued compliance with social distancing, even as the weeks wear on. This is why we are continuing to see better than expected outcomes. The information is clear, and the conclusions are leave no room for doubt. We have also stated all along that practice social distancing is the most important thing Vermonters can do, and it's clear that together our mutual sacrifices are helping us to defeat the virus and continue to save lives. On our next slide, we address the new case growth over time. Vermont continues to see a downward movement in the number of new cases of COVID-19 reported. Over the last week, our three-day growth rate fell to less than 1%, down from 2% last week and down from 9% the week before. You can see how quickly the virus was growing here in Vermont uh, in mid and late March. And then you can equally see how quickly Vermonters were able to stop the virus in its tracks come late March uh, and middle part of April. At this point, we don't expect our case number in Vermont to double for 37 days. That's an improvement from 27 days last week. Again, I think this clearly shows you how quickly uh, our social distancing ever, efforts were effective, and that is great news for Vermont. Our next uh, slide will show our hospital, will show actually our forecasting uh, for the uh, time period ahead. You can see our number of forecasts that we ran over time, and even the one that we ran this week shows that our actual data continues to beat those trends. Again, this is very good news, and again, is clearly connected to the social distancing that Vermonters continue to practice. Our next uh, forecasting continues to give us confidence that we can meet the healthcare resource demands for COVID-19. Our PPE supply, our hospital and ICU and ventilator capacities remain far above the current projected needs. Our next slide shows that the trends indicate we are continuing to see improvement in our actual hospital demand. We see the number of hospitalized patients start to decrease, the number of ICU patients, and the number of ICU and ventilated patients decreasing uh, as well. Again, uh, when we compare this to last week, our numbers have improved, and this is a very good indicator. With all this positive news, I do want to stop and remind everyone that we need to stay vigilant. Although we have seen a reduction in the new number of COVID-19 cases, many people in Vermont are still shedding the virus, meaning that they can infect other people. 
As we can see on our next slide, we don't anticipate reaching our peak on this important measurement until about a week or so. So again, more good news we anticipate on the way, but only if we continue to make the sacrifices uh, that we have been making for the weeks uh, that lie behind us. Our next slide shows that the percentage of Vermont COVID-19 tests that come back positive over time is also trending in a good direction. This indicator is very good news for Vermont. The experts on our team and also those at the World Health Organization indicate that the confirmed positive cases under 10% indicates a state or a region is on the path to containing the virus. And here in Vermont, we've been consistently under that 10% threshold for over a week. Again, while maintaining consistent testing, all very good indicators. Looking ahead, uh, we mentioned last week that we had partnered with the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, better known as IHME, one of the nation's premier COVID-19 forecasting institutions, and expect their researchers to provide us with a forecast with Vermont specific data sometime early next week. We believe their model will follow our other forecasts and confirm the good progress we have seen across our state. We were, we were also heartened to see that IHME included Vermont in a small grouping of states that are best positioned to reopen at the appropriate time. Also, for those interested in learning more about any of these forecasts and our modeling partners, uh, their assumptions, their methodology, their underlying forecasts, I encourage you to visit our department's COVID-19 webpage, which as of yesterday includes all of that information, as well as any of their interactive models as well. I want to again thank all Vermonters for their continued compliance with state guidance. You are making a major impact and everyone should be very proud. However, as the governor emphasized, we cannot let this incredible work that we've all made pass in vain. We must continue to stay on this uh, important social distancing track for the benefit of our neighbors, but particularly for the benefit of those who are most at risk. I know if we do this, we will emerge from this crisis even stronger and even more resilient. Thank you very much. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Levine. Thank you. I don't need to reiterate the data presentation today, and I don't want to detract from the important messages that came from Commissioner Pichak and the governor. So I'm going to limit my remarks today to one public health message, and it's an important one. As a byproduct of the COVID era that we're in now, healthcare institutions across the nation are reporting marked decreases in patients presenting with heart attacks, strokes, and other serious medical illnesses. One could try to come up with a scientific theory about why that is, and indeed, research is underway. However, the prevailing thought is that the diseases have not gone away, but people are reluctant to present to hospitals and other healthcare institutions, worried that they might contract COVID. A very understandable concern, you might recognize, but at the same time, my message today is our institutions are safe, especially here across Vermont, should you have symptoms that make you think you have COVID, call your healthcare uh, professional. But should you have symptoms that you think might be more serious, such as an impending heart attack, a possibility of a stroke, or any other serious condition that you would have normally sought medical care for, please make sure you seek medical care, whether that be with a phone call, whether that be with a 911 call, or a presentation to an emergency room. Thank you. At this point in time, we'll open up for, for questions. All right, we're gonna start in the room with Stuart. Um, Dr. Levine, are you saying that you would be worse off staying uh, you reacting to the fear of COVID, then I mean, put it plainly, uh, if you would. Um, you know, you're at greater risk by staying home if you feel you're having a heart problem, you would be going to a hospital, is that? Absolutely. 
I really do believe that. Um, our healthcare workers go to their site of employment every day. Um, they, act, they are heroes, truly, as they are being called commonly uh, across the country, uh, because of the fact that they may be exposed to other patients with COVID. But clearly, if they were uncomfortable with the environment they were going to, they would not show up. Um, and the fact is, one can go to that environment with a non-COVID complaint and feel comfortable that everyone being on such a high covert alert status themselves uh, will treat them in the way that they would want to be treated so that they can have their condition attended to and not come out of there with an infection as a byproduct of that visit. Can you, I mean, are you separating COVID patients from others such that people can expect they would not be exposed when they walk in the emergency room door? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a protocol for uh, every person who's going to present to an emergency room. And I think the staff are well aware of how to make sure that the right things happen for the right person. And of course, our EMS responders are also on very high alert regarding COVID as well. So again, their environment that you would enter on your way to the hospital, if it was that serious, would also be uh, protective for you, just as it would be protective from them if you actually had COVID yourself. Um, as a, or a question for maybe the governor or um, Commissioner Harrington. So in the first turn of the spigot this past week, how many Vermonters went back to work? Because I'm just wondering if it's possible to be able to uh, do, I guess, forward contact tracing, right? In terms of, you know, maybe people sign in to work and so we know um, how many people are actually getting back to work. Yeah, I think it's a bit early uh, to retrieve that information uh, because it's, uh, you know, as we gave the order, uh, it's two, two people at a time uh, starting on Monday. Maybe some didn't go to work immediately and to collect all the, the data is going to be difficult in this short time period. But, uh, but over time, again, from our standpoint, it, it's important to have that and know how many people are going back to work and how many people are coming off, let's say, unemployment. Um, but at the same time, just watching the trajectory and watching the modeling to be sure that uh, the number of uh, COVID cases, uh, positives, uh, aren't rising at a dramatic rate. Uh, and they may rise a little bit as we open up more businesses, uh, but we don't exceed the, uh, the, the limits of our health care system. So that's what we'll be watching. Um, um, maybe Commissioner Harrington, do you have any uh, thoughts on this as either? Uh, I'll just add, Governor, that uh, we'll be watching. Um, we'd really be looking for trending data in terms of number of weekly claims filed. So, like you said, at this point, uh, it's just too early. But uh, as we see the trend line um, go going forward, we'll be able to report back. And uh, as a follow-up, do we know what percentage of the workforce, um, I guess, shut down when, when we had all these mass closures? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, we know obviously uh, how many have signed up for unemployment and, uh, and through the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance uh, with self-employed and independents, uh, that's starting to trend a bit and we're getting gathering those numbers. So uh, we know the magnitude of um, the tens of thousands and Ms. Commissioner Harrington, do you have a, a figure on how many at this point in time are on unemployment uh, or assistance uh, at this point? Yeah, so uh, we know that our uh, workforce is somewhere between 330,000 to 350,000 uh, under normal circumstances. Uh, we know also that we've uh, received um, roughly 80 to 85 initial claims. That's prior to PUA, um, but not all of those uh, are are eligible, of course. So I think we're roughly at about uh, somewhere between 20 to, to 23 percent unemployment. Um, but again, that's a very fluid number as we see numbers, you know, weekly filings go up and down each week. Steve, did you have a question? Okay. All right, we're going to go to the phone lines now. Uh, the first up on the phone is... 
Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. I'm just wondering if the governor can give an update or somebody can give an update looking uh, towards Memorial Day weekend. Um, I've heard from several people this uh, over this past week who are concerned about planning for Momo large Memorial Day events. In one case, there will probably be about three or 400 people at an event. Should they continue planning for that event? And I'm, I'm also wondering when the state can expect to open up the personal care services um, industry, whether it's um, beauty salons or hairdressers or something along those lines. Um, and can you kind of give an update when that's going to happen? Thanks. Yeah, again, very difficult to, to determine at this point in time. As I said, uh, we're watching the data, uh, watching the trending, uh, making sure that the numbers aren't growing. Uh, so as we open the spigot one little turn at a time, uh, we don't do anything uh, that would have a detrimental effect on, on Vermonters. So um, to determine something out that far, uh, Memorial Day is going to be, uh, again, uh, very difficult to do. I know that there are some parades who, um, in, and Memorial Day parades uh, who have already canceled. Uh, so I, I would expect uh, we'll see more of that as time moves on. But again, I can't stress enough uh, this this moderate approach, um, methodical approach is, is something that we're just going to have to take week to week. Uh, and for me to, to promise or uh, to take something away from someone uh, who is counting on, on this a, a month or a month and a half away, uh, I don't think would be, uh, would be beneficial either. So again, you'll just have to bear with us. Uh, we'll do the best we can in trying to open up this economy and get people back to whatever normal is in the future as quick as possible. But uh, I, would, uh, I wouldn't be able to give you any dates at this point or any certainty. Okay, thank you. What about the personal care services? Um, any indication when they might be able to uh, reopen? Again, um, you know, we look at, uh, at risk uh, there as well. Um, when I see some of, I was reading a John Hopkins uh, report, guidance to governors, and uh, you know they give a rating as to what uh, what is high risk or or, or high uh, densities and so forth. And uh, so we, we take some of that, and we have this team that is working on what would uh, what we could open and benefit the, the most people uh, with with the least amount of risk. So. Uh, I know our team is uh, is looking at this uh, and is presenting on a on a weekly basis as to what they uh, what they have for ideas, uh, but um, but I'm I'm sure it I mean it'll come up at some point, but I, I'm not sure where it is on the uh, on the list at this point. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Wilson, the AP. Okay, I'm no longer muted. Um, I have uh, three questions, but I think the first one is really simple. Um, a few minutes ago, one of you mentioned the, I think it's the IMHA, IHME, are those, is that the correct initials, um, had some sort of a report or something or other that Vermont was among the best states to go forward. Is that something you could share with us? Uh, I would be interested in seeing that. Um, well, let uh, just take one at a time, maybe. Commissioner Pichak? Okay, sure. I mean, that's just, a, you know, send us a link or whatever question. I, I'd be interested in seeing that. So, Wilson, if you do go to our website, and I think it was provided in the media briefing, uh, we do have uh, information about IHME's interactive model, uh, also their white paper. If you go into that website, you'll be able to find information updated as of last Friday, putting Vermont with um, four other states or three other states uh, that are in the best position to reopen. Okay, great. That's, I, I will go look for that. Thank you. The second question is, why do you think, this is for whoever wants to answer it, why do you think Vermont is doing so well? I mean, is it a function of being a small state, um, or is it just better management and cooperation from everybody? I, I, would, I would have to say, and I, I'd ask Dr. Levine to weigh in as well, but from my standpoint, it's just the amount of cooperation we've had. It's about Vermonters and doing the right thing. and. And they don't always like what they hear, um, but I was pleasantly uh, surprised uh, when we had one of the initial closures was the bars and restaurants. And this was right before St. Patrick's Day. And I thought that there might be an uprising as a result. Uh, but, uh, but again, I, I have to give uh, 
Vermont is a great credit and those owners of those businesses uh, for closing down immediately and seeing the risks. And uh, I think we care about each other uh, enough to know, and we're a small state, rural in, in nature, but I think it's just how we're built. And, and, I, and I think when, you know, when we're in trouble, we band together and try and do the right thing. So I think it's, it's probably all the above, um, you know, the strategies we've used along the way. Again, they've been, they've impacted a lot of uh, people personally uh, and financially. And, uh, but at the same time, it, it, it appears that we made the right decisions uh, and we did this together. And, uh, and it wouldn't, you know, putting these measures forward um, is, they're only as successful as uh, people who have a willingness to do it and follow direction in some respects. And, and again, we've, uh, I think Vermonters have come together in this time of need to do the right thing. Mr. Levine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> I can't add a lot to that because I don't want to minimize anything that was just said as being the key players in that role. Um, the only additional things I'd say are we did follow the science and we followed the data um, that uh, you've been looking at all along. And a lot of this is about um, timing of things. Uh, as we're fond of saying, it's not always the if, but it's the when and the timing was very carefully calibrated for each of the interventions that came very sequentially over time uh, and in the end comprised the suite, if you will, of mitigation interventions. Um, and they all needed to be done to be successful, but they needed to be done in the way they were done uh, and played out. Um, and I think we did try to be as early as possible in this epidemic which is an important point, uh, not to let things get out of hand, but also not to come in with the most stringent policies at a time when they might not have been effective. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. The third question is it's a simple one for Dr. Levine again. You were just talking about uh, healthcare providers noticing people aren't seeking uh, medical uh, services. Are there any bad outcomes that you can point to? You know, somebody who did have chest pains, didn't go to the doctor, and then things didn't turn out like they could have if they would have uh, uh, got prompt attention for it, you know, in any, not just heart attacks, anything on there. Yeah, so there's, there's more national data than I can cite local data. Um, and it's just statistical, just knowing the normal frequency of these events in a population and saying, there can't be a silver lining to COVID that there's less of these events occurring because you've acquired the virus. It's probably because people aren't presenting as much. Um, one to-do thing on the to-do list is to work with our medical examiner because we so often cite, recite to you the deaths that came as a result of COVID, but that's not the only thing people are dying from and to see if there is anything uh, unusual about rates that are being seen that would uh, contribute to what you were uh, implying that maybe we are having bad outcomes that we're just not aware of. The other thing we'll learn quickly, uh, when the healthcare system gradually begins to open up again, is um, if there are people who actually have done worse because they weren't attending to things until they felt more comfortable engaging with the healthcare system. Um, Hopefully that won't be the case because we have such a robust telemedicine, telehealth, and even telephone medicine operation going on now that I know Vermonters are accessing. So hopefully uh, we won't find that they've let things go too long. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Wilson, I just wanted to also add uh, maybe a little caution to the wind and something that uh, I always have my eye on, and I, I've mentioned this before. But as we have all this good news uh, here in Vermont, we're not an island uh, and we're uh, doing all the right things and, and we're seeing uh, the benefit of doing that. Uh, but not very far from us uh, in some of those uh, other states, uh, New York uh, is uh, past their peak, but they still had thousands of deaths uh, last week. Um, Massachusetts, Boston in particular, they had 1,000 deaths again last week. They're in their peak right now. That's 180 miles away from us from right here. Uh, as well, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, I'm still right in the middle of it. So 
That's why I'm, you know, we have to do this methodically, cautiously, uh, knowing that anything can happen. And, uh, and we just have to make sure that we're as cautious as possible and protecting and watching the modeling uh, to make sure that we don't exceed that healthcare capacity because we could use, we might need it at some point. So I just, again, with all the good news, I just want to let people know what's on my mind as we move forward. Okay, thank you very much, all of you. Thanks, Wilson. Joe Barton Chronicle. Hello, I think this question is for Commissioner Peter. Um, I was looking at the, um, the slide labeled positive trend active cases in Vermont, and I noticed that um, after 419 2020, the lines representing active cases and confirmed COVID cases diverge radically. Um, I understand the active cases going down. I don't understand the um, the red line going up. Is this just a question of more testing? Yeah, so good question, Joe. So the, act, the active uh, cases, as you point out, uh, start to go down, and that's because the confirmed number of cases starts to slow down. So as we get m less and less cases, uh, new cases into Vermont, uh, then obviously those cases that were active, you know, 14 days prior, 10 days prior, uh, those folks recover and get better. Uh, they're no longer actively shedding the virus or actively have the virus. Uh, but the additional new people that uh, have the confirmed virus continues to shrink. So we see that we see those numbers diverge as the confirmed cases do slowly go up. And again, this is a forecast and we're doing better than that forecast. Uh, and then the active cases again uh, start to drop off pretty quickly thereafter. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm not sure who this is for, but uh, the governor uh, noted at the start to uh, keep the eyes on the data, and uh, the Islander continues to get inquiries from readers, not only in the islands, but readers in Colchester, Milton, in the Franklin County. They want to know about their individual towns and maybe their neighboring towns. Local, local, local. They want uh, to know about the test in their towns. Yeah, Countywide numbers map can be misleading and meaningless. <laughs> Franklin County shows 90 cases, but three dozen of those have moved to Caledonia, which claims 12. So who else has moved? And now that HIPAA has been disputed, is no longer a valid, uh, is not a valid reason to withhold this. I'm just wondering uh, when we're going to see these individuals and as Dr. Levine shared these with the local health officers who are the health department network. I think, I think we have an answer for you. I'm going to let uh, Secretary Smith answer this one. Mike, I think this Mike Smith, uh, Secretary of Human Services, I think you brought this uh, issue up about a week ago, and we've been working on a map that will list um, these uh, confirmed positive cases by town. I think we'll be ready by Monday to uh, display that list as, uh, as we move forward. So you'll be able to see the data uh, by town on Monday on a map that will be on the health department website. No, I heard a sandwich. A turkey. Uh, hello. I don't know. There's some interference I didn't hear. But I'm just wondering, who, Dr. Levine, I'm just wondering if you have shared that with your individual local health officers, uh, whether you shared them with the governor, the public safety commissioner. What is, who have you shared the individual towns with so that local officials know whether they've got a problem uh, in their town? Yeah, so the sharing comes with the actual data being completely uh, authenticated, ac made accurate, etc. So it will all happen on Monday. So the local health officers in your network there have not even been told if they've got a problem like uh, in the town of Swanton or Manchester or Wallingford or something, if they've got a huge percentage of the county number, they have not been told at this point. 
Uh, true, although should they have what, whatever you call a huge problem, we would have already been in the loop with them on that. Well, how many towns have you reached out to them that yeah, have so, a huge problem? So most of the towns that we've reached out to have facilities in those towns where outbreaks have occurred. And so because of, by virtue of having the facility uh, and people working at that facility, they are aware of what's going on. Throughout the rest and of the can block, we get a list of the, can we get a list of the facilities? I know we've talked about Birchwood, Burlington Health and Rehab, the Correctional Center, you know, this, this, but can we get a complete list of all those facilities? Yes, and I believe we've shared a lot of that uh, previously, but we can do that again. I, I know we've got a lot of them. I just want to make sure we're not missing any. Sure. Right. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Brittany, Local 22. Um, hi, so kind of a two-part question here. I was worrying, I'm wondering about the status of the unemployment log. I mean, we've got a lot of calls from our viewers saying um, that they still can't like, get through and they're not getting the payment protection program. Um, either it's not taking applicants or it's not ready and they're not getting their benefits. Um, so I was just wondering about that. Is it backed up and everything? Um, and then I guess the second part of my question is just about, we also had a viewer ask about um, being, you know, self-employed and that they should, they filed for unemployment a week ago. And then now they're trying to file to be self-employed, but they're told that they're not allowed to because they're already in the system and they're having issues with that. I'm just curious as to, you know, what they should do. I'm going to turn this one over to uh, Commissioner Harrington. Sure. Uh, we continue to work through any backlog we have, but, um, you know, most of the general UI claims have been paid, um, you know, except for those that are going through the adjudication process. Um, we continue to add people to that team to expedite adjudications um, to the best of our ability. Uh, we did open up um, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, not to be confused with the Paycheck Protection Program, um, but the PUA program is for um, uh, individuals who are either independent contractors or self-employed individuals or others who are not generally eligible. Um, the first group that we've allowed to go into the PUA program are the self-employed and independent contractors. Um, there are uh, there are pockets of that group. Um, you know, this has been a, a an ever-changing situation over the past six weeks, uh, including just improvements to our system. Uh, and so there, we are hearing um, nuanced situations where people try to uh, have gone through the initial application program, but then when they try to go into the PUA program, um, there's for some reason the program is not uh, allowing them in or doesn't recognize uh, them or their information. Uh, we've been managing those uh, and clearing those as soon as they come up. Um, but we, we are getting some cases where uh, that information didn't transfer over for one reason or another um, between our mainframe system and the PUA program. Um, but most people, uh, if uh, in terms of general population who are self-employed or independent contractors can go in uh, and complete the application from start to finish, they fill out um, uh, and a new a new claims application or initial claims application, uh, and as they go through the initial claims application, uh, if they begin to identify a self-employed or independent contractor, um, that application becomes expanded to include the PUA application as well. Uh, so they end up filling out um, both components of the application, uh, and then they'll receive uh, contact in in 12 to 24 hours. Um, just letting them know that they are eligible for PUA and can move forward uh, with weekly filings. Um, there is a population out there that we are working through right now, which are people who are not, don't necessarily fall into the self-employed population, but also are not uh, typically eligible under general UI. We are aware of that population. That is where some of the people are getting hung up. Um, and we're, uh, we're working to bring that population into the PUA application. An example of somebody who might fall into that group would be if they, um, 
if they had only been working for their employer uh, for uh, a, a month or two prior to being laid off, they may not have enough wages in the UI system to be eligible. They would eventually become eligible under PUA, and we are moving those people into the PUA system uh, today and over the coming days. So the more and more people will become eligible as they're brought over into the PUA system. Does that answer all those questions? Um, that does. I just have one follow-up. Um, so our viewer also said that they um, they were told to fill out a PUA application and that it would be sent to their email, also check their spam folder that might be in there, but they said they never received it um, and that it had been a couple days and they tried to call, but the DOL is not accepting phone calls. Um, so I was wondering about that as well, if you've heard any issues with this. Sure. Again, it, it, what, there are a couple things that happen there. One is if they submitted the PUA application, it will take 12 to 24 hours to process in the system. The system has only been up for 36 hours. So um, again, it may be that uh, it just hasn't been processed yet, uh, and that's why they haven't received the email. Or um, there was an issue on the claim that needs to be adjudicated. There aren't many of those, but there are a handful of the people who have applied, just so people are aware. Uh, as of about 10 o'clock this morning, we had about 5,800 uh, uh, PUA applications been submitted, and I believe about 19,000 uh, weekly filings that have been submitted um, because people are able to go in and file for back weeks back to March 15th. Um, in terms of the, the phone calls, um, certainly we knew there would be an influx as soon as this program went live. Um, we have our Maximus vendor, which ha currently has uh, 30 people on as of yesterday. They will be adding another uh, 25 people by this afternoon. And then as of Monday, we should have somewhere between 70 and 80 people uh, in that call center alone. And they're the ones handling the, the PUA. Um, we'll, begin, we'll continue to track data and call volumes uh, over both uh, yesterday, today. Uh, the call center is open on Saturday. Uh, and if we need to make additional adjustments, either in more staff or shedding other calls that are going into that call center to a different group of people, we'll be making those adjustments uh, as, as soon as that information is available. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Patricia Bennington Banner. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hi. Um, I just have a very quick question for Commissioner Harrington, and you may have mentioned it and I might have missed it. What, when did the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program officially go live, that is, accept applications? And was it accepting both online and phone applications immediately, or did one start first and then the other? Commissioner Harrington. So it, yes, sir. Uh, it's completely electronic. Uh, we do have a call center up that that will help people uh, answer questions. They, unless someone doesn't have internet or doesn't have a computer, um, you know, we will will complete help people complete applications electronically in those circumstances. But people are encouraged to go online to our website to complete the form uh, electronically uh, under their own power. Uh, and if they have questions, they can call the hotline. I do know that there are some people who have not been able to get through on the hotline. That is something uh, we hope to rectify by bringing on these additional agents this afternoon and then building up to Monday as well. Um, and then uh, with regards to the question of when it went live, it was over the evening of, uh, of Wednesday. Uh, so I believe the first round of people um, received an email uh, Wednesday evening. Um, so again, we're, we're kind of in the first, uh, you know, 36 to 48 hour period of uh, the program really being promoted fully live happened, happened yesterday. And you said that um, you had, I believe it was 5,800 applications as of 10 o'clock this morning for PUA? Yeah, so we had uh, approximately 25 to 3,000 applications by the end of the day yesterday. And as of 10 o'clock this morning, we were up to 5,800. And certainly as we bring in um, more eligible groups, uh, but also as more and more people become aware of the application, um, what I will, uh, we'll see that number grow. What I will just say 
for the record so um, so everybody can share this out there. If if an individual has not completed any application yet for the Department of Labor, on the department's homepage, there is a link that says complete an initial application. That's where they should start. If they click self-employed, it will automatically um, add questions to the application to allow them to also apply both for general UI and PUA all at one time. Uh, and that is the, the quickest way to get into the system. What we are running into or, or the people who are running into problems are people who may have already filled out an application uh, prior to PUA going live. Um, in those cases, if they indicated they were self-employed in their initial application, um, there is a link for them to go into the PUA application and complete the application. Um, but again, there's this other population of people who are not self-employed, not independent contractors, um, but are not eligible for general UI. And it's likely they will be eligible for PUA, uh, and we're working through that process right now. Um, All right, but again, so mm -hmm. yep. Go ahead. If I understand you correctly, I'm just a, a little confused at what you mean. So the, so the people who want to seek PUA should file an initial claim with general unemployment, or they should file an initial claim with PUA, or are those terms one and the same? So the, the, the part where it becomes confusing and, and not of our doing, but um, the federal requirements uh, are explicit in that someone must first be denied for U general UI before they can be eligible for PUA. What we've done is try to streamline that process. So instead of someone submitting a general UI application, waiting for a determination, and then applying for pandemic unemployment assistance, it's mm -hmm. all part of one application. So all they need to do is complete an initial claims application which will allow them to fill out both the general UI questions and the pandemic unemployment assistance questions, it, depending on what they select within the application. The only people that would need to um, simply fill out the PUA portion of the application are those that had already filled out a general UI application prior to Wednesday. Um, and again, that was, um, I know it gets confusing there. There's really no good solution, um, uh, but we're, we're trying to uh, make it as seamless as possible. So if they haven't done anything as of today, um, they simply need to fill out an initial claim uh, application, and that will include if they are eligible for PUA to have them fill out the PUA question. So if they identify, if they make an indication on the form somehow that they would be eligible, like if they were self-employed, if they say they were freelance, things like that. Correct. All right, Patricia, oh, do you have any follow-ups? Maybe you. you can connect with the Department of Labor after afterwards directly as well. I'm good, thank you. Um, Ann Wallace-Allen, VT Digger. Hi, um, my question is about the uh, the order that allows five people to go back to a workplace. Governor, is there any guidance you can give people who I know will be asking, what does that mean for my um, my company that has a lot of different departments where people don't come in contact with each other? Can each have five questions like that that you've probably already heard? Um, can you just give a little more detail? Yeah, I'm going to ask Secretary Curley uh, to give that um, explanation because I believe it's in the guidance. Yes, uh, thank you, Governor. Secretary Curley here. If, if somebody is unclear from the executive order and would like additional guidance, we have additional guidance on our website at accd.vermont.gov. And folks can go there, get additional guidance. If they're still not sure, there's a place to select a, a tab to seek additional guidance and we can get uh, detailed information about how they operate and try to try to walk them through it and get to the right place. Uh, can you just tell me uh, for the example that I just gave you, how that would work? Like if a company has say 40 and only five can go back or if they're never coming back with each other, could there be more? Um, I'm not comfortable not knowing what the setup of their arrangement is, so I'd prefer to, to understand specifically what this, the setup is. There are, there are guidelines in our guidance that talk about spacing. Um, so I would suggest that they go there first, but we're happy to try to get you know those answers for them. I just it would be uncomfortable giving a blanket answer in this situation. All right, thanks very much. 
Um, Thank you. Cat, WCAX. Hi, my question today is about antibody testing. California has already ramped it up, and early data that was described yesterday by Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York from their serology tests have shown that up to one in five people in their city area could have the antibodies to this virus. New York's health commissioner has said he's confident that the tests they're using are accurate enough to use to determine immunity and maybe even send people back to work. I've been feeling several inquiries from Vermonters who want to see if they may have some immunity to COVID-19. They're hearing about these testing programs in other states, and they're wondering why Vermont isn't rolling them out faster. So my question is, when can we see antibody testing among the general population here, and why isn't it more of a priority right now? Sure. Uh, don't conflate the fact that it isn't happening with it isn't a priority, first of all. Um, we had an expert working group report back to us, I believe, just a week ago and they were not comfortable with the state of the testing at that point in time with regards to its accuracy and validity and would it give us the information we were looking for uh, comprehensively. So we elected not to go with it at that point in time. One of their specific recommendations was to not use it for individual use, such as can I go back to work uh, tomorrow, um, but that population level, what we call zero prevalence studies, um, would be appropriate uh, when they could recommend a specific testing panel. So we are going to be doing it on a more population-based basis, uh, as you implied with New York, and um, it will be in the near future, I can tell you that. Uh, it won't be tomorrow. So I guess the follow-up then is, when is our next set of recommendations from that working group due? You said, I know last time that they had a month to reevaluate antibody testing. Is right. it still gonna be a month from now? Did we hear anything else about it? So now we're probably three weeks from now. Uh, I will say that my laboratory team and epidemiology team and myself were on the call last night, uh, just Vermont, with the White House Corona Task, Coronavirus Task Force. and. Uh, we actually asked them many of the same questions you just asked me, uh, and they did not actually have answers to them all at that point in time, and said they would be getting back to us uh, to also help advise us. So we're not just looking to our local uh, expert group, if you will, but we were looking nationally as well. Are we working with New York at all, given that they're, you know, spearheading this among their citizens? Uh, we're not working with New York for this particular problem, no. Though I can tell you that there's lots of conversations going on with New York all the time, but not on uh, launching this uh, prevalence study. Okay. Um, I guess the, the question, I'm going to pull this directly from an uh, email I got from a viewer who's wanting to know if the tests are good enough for New York, why they're not good enough for us. You'll have to ask New York. Um, I've told you uh, the, the uh, guidance we've received, uh, which confirms some of the guidance that I've been hearing from many other places and that my reading has led to as well, uh, but I can't speak for why New York thinks they're good enough at this point in time. All right, thank you. Sean Cunningham, Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Uh, this is a two-part question for Secretary French. The federal government is sending a little more than $31 million in emergency relief funds for the AOE to hand out to Vermont's elementary and secondary schools. Um, first, how will those be, that, that money be apportioned to the various school, school districts? And second, is the AOE, the, the AOE is allowed to keep 10%, with about $3.1 million of the money for administering the funds, but will the AOE be keeping the money or passing it on to help the schools with their budgets? Hi, good morning. Uh, this is Dan French. Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, the first question uh, was how is the AOE going to be allocating those funds out to school districts? Um, firstly, I'll point out the application uh, just went live yesterday after 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so we're still formulating that guidance. But my understanding is that we'll be allocating uh, those funds to the school districts based on the same formula that Title I funds are allocated. Um, which means it's a function of their, uh, basically the census information and poverty levels. Uh, second question, 
uh, pertain to uh, the agency's ability to reserve up to 10 percent, uh, approximately $3 million. Um, yes, uh, we haven't decided uh, how much we're going to reserve at this point, but we are um, anticipating uh, reserving some of that to uh, identify the needs at the state level. Uh, in particular, our expectation is that there are going to be increased needs uh, for social and emotional supports for students. Um, so we're um, thinking that the bulk of our reservation uh, would be uh, targeted to support uh, the social and emotional needs of students as those emerge uh, through systems statewide. Thank you. All right, Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, good morning, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Levine. I have seen reports and actually talked to a doctor about the the, the changing use of ventilators. Um, they've been not as successful, I suppose, as, as hoped, and there's a new procedure of actually turning patients on their stomach while they're on oxygen and not intubating. I'm, and I'm wondering if that practice is being done uh, here in Vermont <clears throat> and if you're finding any success with that. Right, so <clears throat> you're referring to what's called prone positioning, and let's go back before the COVID epidemic. Uh, that's actually been a part of care and ICU management uh, for a select group of patients uh, anyways. So um, even without saying what the cause of their respiratory difficulty was, it was often being utilized as part of ICU management. I don't want to go too much further than that because I'm not actively managing patients right now in the ICU and I can't speak to exactly how that protocol is being um, implemented in the COVID era and if there's been any differences or not. I can say that um, one thing we're learning uh, about this infection is that uh, people, even early in their course, sometimes knowing it themselves in terms of the way they feel, other times unbeknownst to them, uh, can drop their oxygen levels uh, quite a bit if you do uh, oximetry studies <clears throat> on them. So um, I think we're learning that perhaps understanding how well someone's oxygenation is going early on can be useful uh, in hopefully providing what's needed early in the course and maybe preventing the need for ventilator management later on. Um, but it's all in the sort of formative stages right now, so it's hard to say much more about that, but we're gaining a greater appreciation of that in people who thought they were doing better than they might have by how the numbers look, so to speak. As, as a follow-up to that, in, in your earlier discussion about um, patients perhaps being reluctant to go to the hospital, uh, UVMMC um, had a release yesterday about there hasn't been a, a positive case among staff in a couple of weeks, I guess. Is that uh, typical of all the hospitals in the state that uh, the staff are, are not showing any um, uh, positive cases? You know, I don't have data in front of me on that, so I'd be reluctant to generalize in that way. Uh, certainly, we're not hearing <clears throat> about huge healthcare workforce issues, and that was one of the things as we were planning for surge we were really concerned about. Uh, we always talk about hospital beds and ICUs and ventilators, but the healthcare workforce was an equal part of that concern. And we had the Medical Reserve Corps, and we had concerns about would we need to pull people from other places, and that did not come to be. Um, so my hope is that we're not seeing uh, inordinately large numbers of healthcare workers uh, unable to come to work because of COVID. But I am aware there have been infections in healthcare workers. Uh, that that would be completely true. I just don't want to generalize to saying it was a, a minimal problem everywhere across the strait without having data for you. But we'll try to find that. Thank you. All right, great, thanks. Avery, WCAX. Hello. Do you all plan to release more strict guidelines on facial coverings, potentially making them mandatory? And what can you say to the availability of these type of coverings? Um, I know there's been with stores closed and things. I know people have kind of been having a hard time trying to figure out what should they be using to cover their face if they don't have the typical actual mask cloth covering. 
I'm, uh, I'll answer part of that, then I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Uh, but uh, as you can see in the in the guidance, and as we had uh, portrayed last week in, in the guidance, uh, that anyone in the in all employees uh, that are uh, going back to work uh, must wear facial coverings, or in um, in if they're in a retail situation uh, and they're cashiers. Uh, they can utilize uh, Lexan uh, if they've already set it up, a sneeze guard of, of sorts. Uh, but all other employees uh, must be wearing uh, facial coverings. Um, and so we reiterated that in, the, uh, in this week's uh, order as well uh, to make sure that that was perfectly clear. Uh, Dr. Levine. And I would just urge uh, if, you, if people have not done it to go to healthvermont.gov, our COVID-19 website, which um, has extensive information on it about f cloth facial coverings, uh, links to descriptions about how one can make them their own, and also links to places where one can purchase them uh, without, again, uh, making any commentary about uh, which, which place would be better or what have you, just an available list that we have uh, so that any Vermonter can figure something out in terms of what to do for a cloth facial covering. A quick follow-up. Has there been it? Who is enforcing people, employees specifically wearing masks? Is that something that's happening? Um, yeah. You know, that was uh, an important part of this week's order. Uh, and when we wanted to increase the number of people going back to work from three to five or two to five. Uh, we also uh, put in place a, um, a, a guidance uh, to make sure uh, that they were getting um, the, the proper education uh, as well before they go into the workplace. So we have uh, tasked uh, the employers uh, with dedicating a health and safety officer on on these job sites. Uh, and as we increase the numbers going, moving forward, they'll be proper, properly trained uh, by VOSHA, as well as uh, independent uh, associations and so forth, uh, who already have uh, programs in place and have been approved or will be approved uh, by VOSHA. So this is on the employer, uh, a health and safety officer in particular, uh, that will have to make sure that all of the guidelines are being followed. It's not just uh, the uh, facial uh, coverings, uh, but also uh, sanitize uh, different areas um, and other guidelines you'll see in the uh, in the order as well as in the guidance. So um, we want to make sure that the works uh, sites are safe uh, and that uh, all the protections are put into place and that the employees have the training necessary to understand why this is really important because in the future, they'll become a resource for us because they'll be properly trained and can, tra can train others, uh, their families and so forth on why this is so essential. So and in terms of where, where you can have uh, masks made, again, um, I had some, when I saw uh, some of your reports on the National Guard setting up a facility in Essex and I didn't see many of them having uh, facial coverings. I, uh, I uh, engaged uh, the Vermont Glove Company in, in Randolph, and they made some 100 of them up uh, for me to bring uh, to the National Guard members. So there are many Vermont companies uh, who are making these, uh, and I know a, a lot of people have uh, donated their services in this regard, and uh, many have made their own. My wife uh, made uh, a few dozen as well. So uh, it can be done. Uh, you just have to search it out, but there are a lot of companies making uh, these facial coverings uh, right here in the state. Thank you. Alex, journal opinion. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, this question is related to Commissioner Pichek's um, active cases slide. And I'm wondering, are asymptomatic carriers factored into those numbers? Yes, yeah, so um, what we have modeled on the presentation is confirmed cases, but of course, uh, there are asymptomatic um, patients as well. Uh, of course, uh, you know, what the percentage that is asymptomatic, we talked to our experts about that. You know, the estimate could be 25 percent, it could be less, could be more. There's not great scientific uh, definitiveness on that point, uh, but you can assume that uh, though when, when the number of confirmed cases slow down, so do the number of asymptomatic cases. So it is factored in in that sense, but what we've depicted in the chart is just confirmed cases. 
Okay, and just quick follow up. So, so you're still using the the one in four or twenty five percent as sort of a rough estimate. I think it's a fair rough estimate, but again, there's not a sort of scientific conclusion or definitiveness about what that number is at this point. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. Aaron Digger. I, uh, I have a question about um, out-of-state visitors. At the moment, the state has a two-week quarantine in place for out-of-state visitors that could prove difficult to reconcile with summer tourism. As more people start coming up to their summer homes or visiting Vermont places with larger COVID outbreaks, what restrictions are you envisioning for tourists and visitors? Are you concerned about new visitors causing a new wave of infections? Um, yeah, we're very concerned about people coming into our state. Uh, as I explained uh, earlier, um, when we look just 180 miles away uh, to Boston, uh, for instance, they had 1,000 deaths last week, and their cases are continuing to climb, and they're right in the middle uh, of this uh, pandemic, and they're very, very much a hotspot. And, and New York is not out of this uh, either. Thousands of deaths last week with Rhode Island and Connecticut and New Jersey as well uh, being right in the middle of it. So yes, I'm very concerned about what this means to Vermont, and that's why we have to be really careful and cautious about what we do and what we open up, and uh, and because that could be an attraction uh, to some from other states to come to our state. Uh, but so that's why we've left uh, this uh, this measure in place, where if you come into the state uh, outside of Vermont, uh, that you have to self isolate for 14 days. Now, understanding as well that we have a lot of our uh, Vermonters who have wintered in, in Florida or other places coming to that, back to Vermont, uh, we, um, we took this up and I actually tasked uh, our group, our, our working group, uh, to find a way uh, for us to streamline this in some way, whether it's a, going to be a test of some sort, um, I don't know, uh, but it is on our list of, uh, of areas of, of concern for me, Vermonters again, uh, that is just coming back home and we want to make this as easy as possible but until we have that guidance uh, they should uh, consider either staying where they are uh, for another uh, period of time or uh, be prepared uh, to uh, to self-isolate for 14 days once they get here okay as a follow-up um, we're hearing from businesses that operate you know tourism related industries um, summer camps you know, events that are usually occur in the summer that they don't know how to plan for what's going to happen this summer. Do you have any advice for them specifically? Yeah, well, once again, uh, you know, we're taking this week to week. It is on our radar, and we know how important summer camps are uh, to the vast, uh, a vast number of Vermonters, uh, as well as child care facilities. Uh, so it is on our list, uh, something that we hope uh, that we can have some guidance in the, in the near future. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, we don't uh, have, uh, uh, while we're considering it, we don't have anything definitive uh, to give you at this point. Um, but, but, it, but suffice it to say, uh, we, are, uh, we know this is an area of uh, an issue, uh, that these summer camps uh, have to uh, know sooner rather than later, as well as parents who have been counting on this as well uh, for some child care uh, for the summer. So. We're working on it. Uh, we're going to uh, to see what we can come up with. Um, but at this point in time, uh, any mass gatherings over 10 are still limited. And uh, But as we open the spigot a little bit more, hopefully we'll come to some conclusions. Mm -hmm. All right. As a follow-up to the conversation about masks earlier, are there any changes to um, issuing a mask recommendation for people in public places rather than a mask order? Uh, for customers and stores and things like that? Well, we've, we have given guidance that uh, we would hope uh, that people uh, that are going into public places would merit wear a mask. Uh, we hope that em, uh, um, employers, uh, have, obviously employees are going to uh, be required, uh, but we are not requiring uh, people, mandating that people wear masks when they uh, are in certain situations. But, uh, but again, some of the stores, we're hoping they can provide signage uh, and, uh, and guidance and uh, education as to why this is important. Okay, thank you. Dan, Burlington Free Press. Hi, I have a question for Governor Scott. Uh, Governor, we got a lot of good news today, including on 
PPE. But uh, Vermont nurses continue to say that there's an urgent need to increase the supply. <clears throat> They've sent you a letter directly with a whole series of requests on expanding funding and having businesses turn over PPE. So there seems to be a disconnect here that I, I don't understand. And uh, I'm wondering what you can tell me, uh, you know, about that, because the, the nurses really seem to be looking at this very differently. Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to let Secretary Smith answer that or try to answer that. Uh, obviously, I'm wondering about the disconnect as well. Uh, my wife is yeah. a nurse, and uh, so I, I completely understand uh, some of their fears. But uh, Secretary Smith? Dan, Mike Smith, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Um, I, I often say I have two health commissioners, one that, rep that the governor has appointed and uh, reports to me as the secretary of agency of uh, human services and the other one that I live with who's a nurse um, <laughs> as well. But the, to get to your question, I met with the CEOs. We do have a sufficient supply at the state level of PPE. And there is a disconnect here. Um, and I've asked the CEOs of all hospitals uh, about a week ago to start trying to communicate to their employees on the use of their PPE uh, and how they're deploying their PPE because um, we have had, as you can see in the, in the slides, we can, we've had a, or it's on the website, we've had a uh, sufficient um, amount of PPE. Now, you know, as we go forward, we're going to have to be careful with PPE as we start opening up uh, different uh, avenues as well. But there is a disconnect, and we're trying to get to the bottom of the disconnect of why we have the sufficient levels and, and still getting these requests for more PPE. So um, stay tuned for more, Dan. Okay, thank you. All right, Peter Hirschfeld, BPR. Pete, BPR. I apologize. Um, Governor, in anticipation of likely revenue shortfalls for the current fiscal year, have you issued any holds on spending for any departments and agencies for money that's already been appropriated for this current budget year? Yeah, uh, again, um, we have uh, we've put uh, a number of measures into place. Uh, Secretary Young is on the phone, I believe, at this point, and she can explain further. But, uh, yeah, this is going to be an issue as we move forward. Uh, we're going to have uh, tremendous uh, opportunities, uh, tremendous holes uh, in our budget, as well as on the, uh, you know, the state side, local side, uh, and all throughout uh, state government. So um, we're going to have to make some tough decisions uh, in the coming months. Uh, but uh, Secretary Young, do you have anything further you could offer? Uh, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Peter. Yes, you've, you've got it correct that we have um been looking at our end of year fiscal year budget, we have put a directive out to agencies and departments to um, minimize any any uh, discretionary expense expenditures they have um, for the next three months or the next two and a half months now or nearly two months. Uh, a hiring freeze um, for other than non-essential or critical employees which are going through the secretary's office. And more importantly, we've put out um, requests for submissions for a supplemental budget adjustment to be taken up by the legislature in May. And we are um, uh, collecting those submissions this week and formulating a, a proposal for another budget adjustment. Thank you. Dana, Caledonia Record. Good afternoon. Uh, this is for Secretary Smith. Uh, it, was re it was reported yesterday that the inmates within the search facility here in St. Johnsbury uh, are not showing any symptoms of the virus and are currently undergoing testing uh, to see if, in fact, the infection is, still exists. Um, this was said to have happened, is going to happen within the next uh, two days. So the question is, uh, if negative 
how soon will the inmates be returning to the Northwest complex? And will the transfer happen piecemeal if some of the, of the 33 are still found to be infected? Thank you for the question. There's, um, there's a complex dance that's going to have to happen here. First, those, um, those uh, inmates at St. Johnsbury are going to have to have two negative tests before they're eligible to be moved. Secondly, we want to make sure that Northwest has been uh, tested as well for the second time or retested for the second time as we, as we move forward. So we're going we're gonna to test the individuals at St. Johnsbury to make sure, A, they get um, their two negative tests that happen, and then B, we're going to make sure that the facility in, um, in St. Albans is, is retested, and then we'll start making moves based upon those test results uh, in the near future. I think the St. Albans facility is slated for retest uh, starting this weekend or beginning of next week. Okay, is that the same time frame uh, for the the second test to come through in St. Johnsbury? Yeah, I think it, we're I think we're doing the the second test either uh, today or tomorrow uh, or over the weekend. But it's it's relatively uh, in short order here. It, it's sort of in conjunction with the time frame that we're doing uh, Northwest Vermont. Okay, and thank you, sir. Just one follow up: um, as there haven't been any. Uh, additional um, inmates come to the St. Johnsbury facility um, beyond the, the 33 uh, almost you know, about two weeks ago. Um, is there a sense that, uh, is there a plan, I guess, on the books that says when are we going to be able to, to not call St. Johnsbury a surge facility anymore? Or is it too early to tell for something like that? I, I think it's too early to tell for something like that. We always want to maintain surge capacity depending depending on what is happening on the ground. Certainly, uh, Northwest was um, a, you know, as we tested in Northwest, we had that surge capacity in St. Johnsbury. Um, we have the policy, as you know, that if, if one uh, case uh, is positive in an institution like a correctional facility, a long-term care facility, we will do universal testing in that facility. So um, it's just too early to tell what what's going to happen here in the next uh, uh, month, I would say, or so. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just so we can, I'm clear um, on what our intentions are, our goal is to bring uh, those who have been sent to St. Johnsbury uh, that are COVID positive back to that facility uh, where they came from. So just as quick as we can, we want to get them back uh, to the Northwest Correctional Facility. Colin, seven days. Hi, I have uh, two spigot related questions for the governor. Um, first, um, should we just be expecting um, announcements like this every Friday moving forward? Are you planning to make weekly announcements or uh, could you just tell us your timeline on that? Yeah, th that's uh, that's basically my hope, Colin, that we can we can do this every Friday, um, work throughout the week, watch the modeling, uh, watch the tra trajectory, watch other states uh, trying to determine what they're doing as well uh, so that uh, we can we can work together in some capacity uh, and try and catch up to where they are uh, quite frankly uh, because we've been very restrictive and have benefited from that so that's uh, that's the plan uh, hopefully we can continue to have good positive news and uh, we'll be able to again open this uh, in a methodical way so we can put people back to work yeah, and then just to follow up on that, when you mentioned other states, I mean, how much is that going to weigh into your decision making, the, the experience that other states are having in curbing the spread of the virus? I think you mentioned um, being aware that opening up too fast here might encourage people from other states to, to flock to Vermont. So can you just talk a little bit about um, your thinking there? Yeah, in terms of uh, some of the attractions in Vermont, uh, you know, whether it's our campgrounds or uh, state parks uh, and so forth, uh, if we, um, in the case of, uh, I know New Hampshire and Maine are very concerned uh, about their beaches, uh, for instance. And so 
Uh, not that that's a concern for us, but uh, that's why they want to work together as a region with Massachusetts uh, to make sure that they're open, all of them at the same time, so that one state isn't impacted. Uh, now, Massachusetts isn't anywhere near ready to do anything like that at this point, but I know they're under an incredible amount of pressure to do so. Same holds true for, for let's say, golf courses. I know a lot of pressure is being put on uh, those in Massachusetts uh, and uh, in New Hampshire and Maine, as well as in Vermont. Uh, but if one uh, does it and the others do not, uh, it just puts a lot of burden on that one state and could uh, impact them in an adverse way if, uh, if we're to open up and, and a lot of people from Connecticut and uh, New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts and so forth come to our state uh, to play golf. So that's why we're trying to coordinate in some some senses, uh, and uh, and we'll continue to, you know, I have almost daily talks with other governors in some state uh, across the country, but certainly here regionally, uh, we're staying in touch uh, to at least be aware of what they're doing. Uh, some of what's happened in New York, for instance, I, I wasn't aware until I heard it on, from, from the media. So um, we're coordinating more with, uh, with New Hampshire, Maine, Mass, and so forth. Thanks. All right, that's all of our questioners today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. We'll see you on Monday. Thanks for tuning in.